Welcome everybody to this London Futurist discussion on the case for longevity politics. And I am joined with Attila Chordas, who is standing as an independent candidate in the east of England for election to the European Parliament. Attila, why don't you introduce yourself? Thank you so much, Davies, and thank you so much for the opportunity. And I would like to welcome everybody here. So this whole idea of me running a candidate is, is, is a crazy idea. But just like the whole European elections in the UK was sort of like a floating idea, even like two months ago, I remember I was on the Genom campus where I worked at that time. It's near Hingston and it's near Cambridge where I live. And I was thinking about actually check the Wikipedia. Are there going to be any EU elections in the UK, considering the situation we are in? And the answer was, the official answer was no. And so I was saying that we are living in such a counterfactual world. It's, it's, it's a concept that philosophers are using. Is that something that so many things have changed in a direction. So the world we are living in is a possible world. It's the actual possible world. But these earth shaking events or these big democracy um, stress testing events that happened recently, I felt like it's it's taking us into an alternative reality. And so like it feels like time is out of joint in many ways. So me as a biologist, as a longevity scientist, as a longevity startup funder, and as a philosopher who's thinking along the lines of what our life would look like if we could live healthier for longer and be on a trajectory upwards and upwards and faster than we currently are, I was thinking, why I, it, it's a situation for a philosopher to stand up for what he believes in. So here I am, two months forward, and um, it was only just uh, uh, 25th of April when the nominations um, have ended. So I went that day to Chelmsford and um, nominated myself as an independent candidate. Uh, another thing, I'm, I'm also kind of an outlier, not just my name, uh, uh, but that I'm being uh, from Budapest, Hungary originally. It's my weird name for English speakers. It's Attila, and you, you said it just great. Uh, so in the EU, there is a right that if you're a resident of another European country that belongs to the EU, you can stand there as a so-called cross-border candidate, cross-European candidate, uh, while you are uh, saying, declaring that you're not standing in your back home country, which I'm, I'm obviously not. So you can do this in here. And actually, I'm not even sure that somebody else is in the UK is in the same uh, ship uh, as me doing this. But, but it's, it's interesting. So let's uh, let uh, bring the viewers up to date with wh what you're actually uh, doing and standing. What I'm showing here is the map of the constituencies for the European elections. There are just uh, 12 regions throughout Britain. Scotland is a region by itself. So is Northern Ireland, so is Wales, Wales and so is London. And the rest of England is divided into eight regions. And you, Attila, are in this... Uh, East of uh, London, east of England <laughs> here, east, yeah. east of England here, which uh, looks like it's East Anglia and a bit more. Yeah. And each of these constituencies elect a number of MEPs. This one elects seven. And if we look at how the results broke out in the last time there was an EU election in Britain, which was five years ago, 2014, uh, in that case, there were 543 thousand votes in your region for UKIP, who got therefore three of the seven MEPs. Next, there were three for the Conservatives, one for Labour, and the other parties who got fewer votes, such as the Greens and Lib Dems, didn't get any MEPs, and nor did a number of minor parties either. So that's the context in which you are standing. And I checked uh, a link you sent me earlier, Attila, that shows all the candidates this time round. There are fewer parties. And here you are as a splendid uh, independent at the bottom here, uh, by standing by yourself along with these other parties. So what are you going to do to get the number of votes, which might be at least uh, 100,000, to have a chance of getting uh, one, uh, one of these votes? 
Yeah, thank you. It's really good to see these numbers up. It's like more than one and a half million voters, uh, 2014. Uh, there's many things happened since this 2014 election, right? Uh, the winds have changed, and I'm obviously very much of an underdog candidate standing here. Um, and I would like this to use this opportunity for things like this, when it's not really me, I'm the medium of the message that I'm trying to broadcast here about. We can talk about something else. We can give priority to something else that what we currently talk about in mainstream politics. And if you just, you, you, you were informed about the local election events that happened, not in particular London, but here in Cambridge and all around the UK, just like a couple of days ago. And what, what happened there is that all, lots of independent candidates that stand up uh, who are saying no to the status quo uh, got way more uh, political leverage now. And all the big mainstream parties uh, were sort of um, downvoted and, and punished for their current ways of not being able to come up with a big decision that affects the story of this country quite well. So that would say me as a favor for I might get a chance to cause a little bit of a surprise in terms of the actual votes that I'm getting. Uh, but besides that, it would be about talking healthy longevity that is prioritizing um, health and longevity that comes with it. Uh, now, these have different connections, so there's different outcomes that we're talking about here. Prioritizing biomedicine and, and pri prioritizing basically a way more democratic and peaceful world through this agenda. Let's look at something which I found on your website, which uh, I've never seen on any other political website before. The, yeah. And uh, you seem to be sharing this sign quite often uh, yeah. from uh, publication in cell.com. Perhaps you can talk through why have you put such a, a scientific logo on your website? Where does this come from? Is this fringe science or mainstream science? Uh, and why is it question. important? Yes, very good question. Also, if you look at it, it looks like a nicely arranged um, shield or something. and. Anytime I'm using this, by the way, I'm referencing uh, another nerdy scientific thing called the PMID number, which is the publication number of this particular publication uh, that you actually giving the credit where the credit is due. So this paper was published by mostly European scientists, uh, Linda Partridge um, and Maria Blasco from Spain in 2013 in the one of the the highest ranking uh, scientific journal called cell and it actually has really really changed the whole field of uh, molecular biogerontology which is the field that before that before 2013 was sort of a backwater not too much funding went through because people were thinking about biological aging which we know is an enormously complex thing it affects our body throughout many many processes we just couldn't see uh, the trees from the forest beforehand so when at the end of the 90s when i finished my bi biology um, undergrad degree i wanted to do aging phd i just couldn't do it because everybody told me that oh bollocks it's it's such a too many variables do something with cancer autoimmune diseases the well-defined diseases that we are setting an eyes on and that thing has completely changed in the last two decades. In terms of our understanding, um, this is the historical opportunity here that is giving me the wings, politically speaking. So we have now wings in terms of the science and technology. Uh, and the main thing that we see, can you, can you switch back on that? Um, so others are seeing this. So this is nine big hallmark events of the biological aging uh, that are mainly coming from model organism studies, so mice, Drosophila, Sonora, this is elegans, it's a li little nematode worm with 969 cells. So all these nine events are the ones that are tested in many, many experiments, uh, experiments. so lots of um, positive data was saying that these are the processes that are going a bit south with aging. So with chronological aging, um, if we are fastening up these processes, uh, the aging output, the phenotypic output of aging is going to be worse. If we are trying to ameliorate, uh, block these processes, we're going to get um, healthier aging phenotypes. So that means we can decelerate the aging process. So auxiliary, decelerate. So we have 
very strong criteria of why these are the emerging super processes and these are nine processes that are separate from each other but they are providing us for the first time in human history a comprehensive list of all the major hallmark aging processes thereby giving us an opportunity to counteract all these processes that is giving us the opportunity to reset sort of the biological aging process even achieve some sort of a deceleration of it or stopping it or maybe even rejuvenating it at some point should i walk through some of it or just mention one or three would it be okay yeah my, it's quite technical some of the details but it is useful to understand some of the ideas yeah. the stem cell exhaustion yeah, yeah, yeah. which people are aware of that there is yeah. now stem cell therapies are becoming available which yeah. to an extent rejuvenate us in a more fundamental way it's not just treating one disease potentially it's treating many diseases by uh, re restarting the body's own uh, repair mechanisms which depend in many cases on stem cells yeah. Let me mention two more. So if you see this list, there, there's one that are related to DNA, the genome. Everybody thinks about in biology mainstream, something with a genetic makeup or us. That's something that you need to thinker with and you're going to guess the desired output. So that's not true really in biology. So the genomic instability, these are these mutations that are coming in a nuclear DNA, mitochondrial DNA. The telomere attrition, these are the little DNA caps at the end of the chromosomes that are containing the DNA. And the third one is the epigenetic alteration, also modifications, reversible modifications on DNA. So these are just the genetic level ones, and these are only three. And we have six more, and those are also as important as the genetic ones. And I just meant, like to mention two here. Uh, the purple one, which is loss of proteostasis. So this is a very technical term, but you should think here proteins. And by the way, that's my real background, proteomics and proteins. So. The genes are encoding proteins. The, these are the real action molecules of life. Our muscle are being moved and contracted because of proteins. All the anti um, antibodies that our immune system producing are proteins. Uh, albumin that we eat in an egg are proteins. So we are actually very familiar with them. And that process, the loss of proteases, is basically those proteins can only do their job if they have the proper three-dimensional structure. If they are enzymes, cutting some processes, they are digesting carbohydrates, they need to work properly. And if it's not working properly, and this is what happens with chronological aging as the years go and by, there is a sort of a protein quality control process like a protein police, which are proteins themselves. This is proteostasis. And that process starts to not work as properly. And that leads to eventually neurodegenerative diseases like uh, protein aggregates are start to accumulate and they are not digested anymore. They did not um, put a break on these processes. And it's very, very important. It looks like that if we try to fix all the other processes and we don't fix this one, we're going to be losing this um, uh, healthy longevity game. And this gives us another very important theory. So aging is not one thing. It's actually agings. These are separate processes that are independent from each other, but many ways interconnected. Uh, sort of think like cancer versus cancers. And here I need to talk a little bit politics, because if you know, there's Manfred Weber, who is, I think, the main Spitzenkandidate in the European election. It's like a technical term, a German one about the main candidate that stands for the top EU post that now is Juncker. Um, the, the guy from Luxembourg is the EU Commission. He, one of his main pillar of, uh, one of his main marketing ideas is that let's start a fight on cancer. And this is the same idea I think he just basically took without deep understanding from Joe Biden, uh, from the American political plan. And the thing about it is that cancer is one age associated disease. It means that through age, you have much bigger chance to get more kind of and cancers uh, over 40, over 50, over 65. Uh, you go back a little bit. Uh, but the thing is that aging leads to the accumulation of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, neurodegenerative diseases, so all other the big killers. Cancer just being one of them, one of the biggest, but not as big as cardiovascular. So if you want to really tackle this problem, you don't start another war on cancer, which you're probably going to lose very quickly. You start to think more fundamentally and try to address these root causes of aging. 
causes that's going to be leading for you to a much more decelerated aging status in healthy people that's going to be leading to the compression another term sorry more of morbidity of late life morbidity now currently morbidity is that when you have chronic diseases that are compromising your life and this is the real deal with aging so currently uh our late life is spent 16, 20 percent of our whole lifetime is spent with fighting different chronic diseases. Over 65 years of age, more than 60, 70 percent of people have already won two chronic diseases. Over 85 years of age, more than four or five chronic diseases uh, for most of the people. The real healthy aging people who are not showing up at hospitals, we don't know them, those are very, very rare in the population. And we would like to take them as an example, and turn all the other people into healthy and robust in their old age, so they can live a life flourishing. And there's just one more um, hallmark process I mentioned is, um, well, we can mention, well, cellular senescence, let's just call these zombie cells. Uh, these are the cells that stop doing the job with age, and they do not go away with the program cell death. So they just don't disappear, but they like zombies and they're making a hostile tissue environment that is leading to lots of problems. And there are many drugs right now, actually a couple. So it's one of the biggest unicorn in the longevity industry is a company called Unity Biotechnology who are working on so-called senolytics agents that are killing off or just neutralizing these zombie cells in us. So these it, might, yeah, sorry. It has investment from some of the world's richest people like uh, Jeff Bezos, I understand. Yeah, I think he's in Unity story. Biotechnology. So a lot of these uh, areas, hallmarks of aging, do seem to have exciting and interesting <laughs> research happening. There's a whole bunch of things with epigenetics, which is a term that most people hadn't heard of a few years ago. In fact, still, it's very, not commonly known in the in the in the public uh we, people are aware of uh, changes to the genome with things like crispr uh people are increasingly hearing about telomeres as well so there is improvement so why do we need to get politics involved in this why don't we just leave the scientists to proceed at their own pace and making progress in the abolition of aging i would mention two main reasons and, and one of them is a bit personal so i have a a longevity startup in space. I'm not going to mention in, in its name. I'm not doing product placement here, but um, I started a company because I want, I'm so committed to this course since I was 14. And I try to use all different angles to look into the problem of aging and longevity from philosophy, science, bioinformatics, computational biology, and politics. Um, going back to the two reasons. So one is if you really want to give achieve in our lifetime for these generations alive not the oldest old anymore i'm, I'm afraid I, let's be realistic to give extra healthy decades of life that would mean either the average life uh, expectancy is going up so you're going to be living longer but the main point here is that you don't spend your life between 65 and 95 fighting 10 chronic diseases so you are uncompromised so you can pursue your life plan and flourish. Um, so the first reason is, if you really want to act on all these nine hallmarks, there's no way, I'm convinced uh, with my background in uh, business and uh, with science, that there's no one company or no five biggest company. If you take the five biggest Chinese and five biggest US companies, the big IT companies, or right, and combine them, even they would, wouldn't have a chance to do something in the next 10 years to act along all these nine hallmarks to give us the sequence of intervention that's going to give you decades of healthy life. So there's this enormous technical challenge. And that uh, led me to understand that we need public-private projects combined. I was running surveys about this. What do people think? Do we think that longevity industry and the private industry is going to be good enough? It's not going to be enough. That's my strong opinion for a big income that's number one reason number two is ethical reason uh so from number one it follows that you need to put a lot of money in a dedicated way to the root causes of aging to counteract them to come up with effective medicines and by the way if you do so so it's a little parenthesis it's basically it's the idea about that nothing uh 
everything makes sense in biomedicine in the light of aging. We are dynamics being, so most of the diseases are coming with age. So I'm not talking about childhood infectious diseases. There are some like malaria or things, but most of them, the non-communicable ones are related to this. So going back to the reason, uh, the ethical reason is that um, even in this case, if some companies might get into a position to be able to monopolize one of the hallmark processes and all the drugs coming up with it, say cellar senescence or the protein police, uh, we really need access to those if we want to come up with a robust solution to everybody. Nobody can be in a monopolizing position. They cannot be in terms of the whole thing, but not even in one process. And the other thing, the, the, the ethical reason, another one is that this big technological backlash that happened last year related to general tech. When people enter that technology, uh, the Facebook scandals, data privacy breaches and all that stuff, um, when it um, really affects the life of practically everybody right now, and there's a, a real process uh, of now the ethical reinvestigation of all the foundational stuff in technology, even Apple are hiring now philosophers, trying to figure out the ethical sides of the business, which was not in the DNA. I'm in a, a lucky position to be a scientist and a philosopher as well, who dealt with longevity and the biotechnology, uh, the moral problems of biotechnology. And we need to put these things together and we need to do political innovation. So that's these two reasons that are interconnected. Some people may say, that sounds good in principle, but in practice, uh, politicians, uh, public money isn't very effective. It tends to get wasted on grand projects that don't uh, succeed. Uh, there may be some uh, dis uh, there may be some unattractive aspects to the way that commercial companies develop products, but they're more, more successful on the whole. If we had waited for the uh, politicians and public state to develop a uh, smartphones, we probably would still be waiting. But we had uh, companies such as Apple and Nokia pursuing profits and coming up with great products as a result whose prices come down. So how can you be sure that extra money allocated by politicians will be more effective than just leaving it to free market forces and individual entrepreneurs to so, work out? Yes. So currently, the main engine in longevity is the private longevity industry which is very innocent. It's about three, four years old. And by the way, so the cell paper was 2013. And in another landmark event that happened historically is the founding of Colico Life Sciences, which was also 2013. So I remember actually that was, there, there's this scientific understanding and now there's a big company, Google, that puts uh, almost like a billion dollars into this private money to just hire the smartest brains, US mainly, from Ivy League universities and all, all those guys from Genentech to come up with something to understand their aging trajectory. And they are working in secret ever since. They have some higher deal with every different. So, that's how the can politicians do better than Google? Google's putting uh, $1 billion, you say, into this. Uh, I, I, I never mentioned that do better. It's not a competitive zero sum game, it's, it's how you blend these two things together, how you merge them. You should merge them because the scientific challenge is so immersed. So you should come up with a non-competitive way of advancing the knowledge of everybody and still leave some space for the patents and for the driving force of the market. Um, so a bit more like the Apollo moonshot project of uh, John F. Kennedy, which he yes. invested a lot of uh, public money and gave a public vision. Yes. And then he had a lot of companies uh, contributing parts of the yeah. solution it's, to that vision. It's much easier to do this if you are putting a man on moon in space, so it's much more visual, it's spectacular, as opposed to imagine a press conference where I'm sitting down with somebody that looks to me, and I'm gonna say to you, hey, David, by the way, I'm 111 years old. Trust me on that. Yeah, look at me, I'm 111 years old. Can you prove, disprove? Like we know in Jane Carmen's case as well. Um, so it's much, much harder. A marketing problem of longevity is much harder because you, you sort of have to jump in your mind ahead and imagine yourself in a still vigorous state uh, in late life. Do some temporal discounting that most people do. Am I going to be caring about myself 40 years from now? Uh, my message is that you should really care.
and that caring starts right now. But this is not answering your main question still. Um, some sort of a mix of private and public projects. And when we talk about public projects and the big consortium projects that you mentioned, uh, by the way, uh, uh, the, the, the Human Genome Project being the most spectacular of them that actually delivered, although Craig Venter delivered at the same time his private solution, head to head, toe to toe. And right now there is actually, these consortia projects have lots of problems, by the way, lots of logistic, organistic, it's just sometimes sheer scientific egos, who is sits where, who's gonna be which author on the paper. Um, and right now there's one called the Human Cell Atlas, which is one that I had a little understanding of. I was not part of it, but I've seen my colleagues, some of them working on it uh, at the Bacom Trust Genome Campus. Um, and what they are doing basically is using single cell technologies to understand all the different cell types. And uh, they don't know yet, or it's not as explicit, but many of these outcomes that are coming from that project are going to be enriching uh, our understanding of aging. There's already some that's just showing that even in the epithelial cells of the throat back end of just normal middle-aged people, you just have way more mutations just accumulating all the time. They don't look like cancer mutations, but sort of make us understand more why cancer hits uh, chronologically older people more than younger ones. Um, so it's just... Um, paradigm shift that I'm talking about that we have these big projects you just need to find the aging angle to it and it's now very very fashionable in science to rename cancer institutes to cancer and aging institute in the United States the biggest funding corpus is NIH and uh, the only thing that got more grants last year besides the big drought of science funding even in the NIH was the aging related ones so people there's a lots of move in a good direction here, but I still haven't answered the question, I think. So Attila, imagine you get a lot of votes on May the 27th and you end up going to 23rd. the parliament. Okay, 23rd, it's different days in different in, parts. In the UK, it's 23rd. 23rd Sorry. of May, right. So imagine you get a lot of votes on the 23rd of May and you are one of the MEPs selected for the East of England and you end up in the parliament in Brussels. What are you going to be doing there? Uh, good. Um, I have not imagined my first day there. That's not was the um, first thought in my mind. First of all, since the UK is in a special situation, I might just get be called back two weeks later if the Brexit deal goes through. So I'm, I'm saying as a philosopher, I can handle this absolute situation well. But actually there was, yeah. Um, what if I get this chance as an independent? The first thing I need to tell is that the first thing is this political innovation about talking this thing, because it's not a main talking point. I mean, health sometimes is a main talking point, but not as big as the other issues. And here you should really think of climate change as well. That is not really on the main agenda. And there are actually people gluing themselves on the roof of trains in London for being so desperate and a bit apocalyptic about we trying to put in brake on that. I'm not suggesting anything related to that in terms of longevity. I don't want people to go to the streets. We should be much smarter than that. It's I there's no reason to be alarmist. Um if there's a cross-European political alliance already, so this is prime time for political innovation, uh, exactly because democratic um, countries are such a turbulent state right now it's stress testing democracy but also it gives good chance to innovate from the bottom up like i'm trying to do so in germany there's another uh, part there's a particular single issue politics party dedicated for this cause of uh, fighting age associated diseases and develop age uh, effective age um, aging medicines. It's called uh, the, uh, the Partei for Gesundheit Forschung. It's the party for health research. It was started a couple of years ago in, in Berlin, uh, Germany, by a guy called Felix Wehr. And uh, I, I knew Felix, I made an interview with him. Uh, we've been part of the same longevity scene, like you are being part of as well. In Brussels, we had a meeting, and then I realized that this guy is really serious. It pulled together many people, and he's advancing this cause, and they are running for the elections. In local elections, they already took like 1.5% of the votes in practically totally unknown. 
And I really like this idea and it actually triggered me standing as a candidate. So it's a cross European thing. And when we think about what we could do if we were elected or in Brussels, we could have a big uh, speaker or megaphone that we can talk to so people would listen. Uh, we came up with um, a number, which is sort of a wish list number, uh, which is uh, 30 billion euros yearly extra for biomedicine, education, all the infrastructure with the main cause of targeting all these root causes of aging uh, in the back of the mind. So it, it's handled most of the biomedical field, but in a targeted, um, tel um, aim-oriented way. And this 30 billion sounds like a really, really big lump sum of money. And this number came into existence sort of, if you think of the whole EU budget is around 160 billion. So we're thinking something that like you should really ask for 15, 20% of the whole budget, which by the way would mean don't, priori don't priori prioritizing many other fields or just rearranging things. And in the current infrastructure, there is um, an 80 billion Horizon 2020 project that mainly is dedicated to science that was from 2014 till 2020, so last year, so seven years, which amounts to roughly 11 billion euros per year for comparison. And there's another one from societal, uh, societal, societal causes. There's another 7 billion uh, for health. Um, that comes down to an extra a billion a year. So if you put all that together, that's like 5 billion for science and health combined per year currently. And we're talking about six times as many. Um, what's going to convince lots of people that it's worth spending six times as much as present on this field of health and longevity? So there's this concept called the longevity dividend, uh, which was uh, actually introduced by, I think it was a scientist, Olshansky. It was an actual uh, biologist, not an economist. Jay Olshansky. Jay Olshansky, and he's a, he's, a, he's a proper biogerontologist, actually. He's not an economist. Um, which is trying to capture this idea of that um, if you have an age distribution, so all these older people, many of them are compromised in life uh, and doing early pensions and all these skills that have been accumulated, uh, we should really turn back into this to boost the economy. There are actually very good, many good signs and studies that are showing this. So in Japan, which is the future of Europe and the US as well, in terms of already 20 or 25% of the population, 20%, at least 65 or older. And we're gonna be in that state in 15, 20 years or so. Uh, they have many initiatives to actually being able to call back people from retirement or jumping back doing jobs because all that skills and experience and the different worldview of people that is just can enrich what we have. So this is captured by longevity dividend. And also if you think about what makes um, all the people not being able to effectively being part of society or going to isolation many times to the golden age of retirement, going back to Florida to their conclaves or little camps that only they are allowed to go to and no younger people show up, which is, I think, not a good idea because they're not integrative part. Uh, what I want to mean is that there's lots of ageism going around that are inbuilt into the society and institutions, basic political institutions. So uh, let's just talk about ageism here a little bit because what I'm talking about that to unleash this power of the longevity dividend, you really need to remove the inner ageist, which is biological aging. That is, blocks us to give us our full potential to late life as well. So don't spend our life. And there's the external ageism, which is the one that people usually talk about and practices that you should call out that are, this is the discrimination, which is the biggest universal discrimination I know out of the big three ones. So gender-based, racial-based, chronological age-based. This is the one that probably, potentially, every human being is going to experience once in their life. That's going to be telling you that, hey, you shouldn't wear these clothes, you shouldn't do this job, because look at your colleagues, 
you shouldn't go work into this big Silicon Valley company because the average age is 27. And maybe if you're over 40, your chances, and here I'm talking mainly about middle-aged people that are already experiencing many of these things. And if you remove the inner cause of this thing, which is the biological aging process that is compromising your life internally, you unleash all this potential. I mean, I think the longevity argument is very strong that if we can uh, delay aging by seven years on average, I think this is what some of the analysis by Jay Oshansky and his colleagues looked at, that means people are not using the health budget so much because they're fitter, they stay at work longer, they consume more, they produce more. And there's also knock-on effects on their family members because instead of their family members having to eat into their own lives, looking after their elderly parents or disabled parents, they're able to go about their, their work normally. So, of course, it costs money to get this benefit, but people who have done the analysis, uh, looking historically, have said that money spent on activities that extend healthy longevity in the past, that's been uh, more than amply repaid. Yeah, yeah. At this stage, I'd like to feed in a question from some of the viewers, a question from Didier Cornell, who is in Belgium, when he's suggesting that uh, here's a good reason for having at least some of the funding coming from public institutions, which is that many people, as you mentioned, uh, Attila, many people are fearful now of tech companies. You mentioned the tech lash. Uh, people are afraid that if it's just left to the big tech companies, then the benefits from this will uh, go primarily to the rich and the well-off. And that we won't get a big public uh, enthusiasm for this uh, initiative unless it's clear from the uh, action of politicians that the benefits will be shared to everybody. Do you agree with that? Um, you, you need to think in terms of... Um stages of how you introduce a technology like that and there's always the early adopters and by the way in these cases are uh, those rich people who are going to be going through the first interventions due to their own account and their own risk they are actually going to be the guinea pigs of this technology uh this is just in parentheses so um absolutely we need um to come up um with an ethical way of phrasing the quality of opportunity that this technology should provide. Um, in terms of how we should do so, so what was the practical questions of Didier? Uh, well, when people who see films like Elysium, Elysium was a film from a few years ago, yeah. in which uh, most people who were living on the earth had a pretty terrible experience with healthcare. Yeah. And those who were very rich could go to some spacecraft going around the earth in which they had a marvelous uh, yeah. rejuvenation therapies. And this is viewed as being an extrapolation of uh, the experience of at least some parts of the world where there is a big divergence. If you can pay for healthcare, it's great. If you can't pay for healthcare, it's terrible. Yeah. So I remember now Jodie Foster was the, the main villain. And I think Matt Damon and trying to work their way through to hop into this pod at the end that just regenerates all of their stuff. That was really, a, I think, a bad sci-fi movie. And by the way, most of the sci-fi and artworks that I have seen are, are taking this thing um in such a negative utopianistic manner this whole life extension thing so like there's one tribe of people who live in the underground for hundreds of years because they have a genetic mutations and this is so not equal folks and uh, so there's no good way of artistically uh what i, I i'm doing and i'm doing as a philosopher is trying to come up with a thought experiment that how this word of contracting aging it's going to look like and let me tell you some word about this because realistically speaking if it's biomedicine there's going to be a lot of invasive technologies so um you shouldn't think yourself of popping one pill on a daily basis if you really want to have lots of extra it's going to be way more scrutiny and actually uh, way more testing involved in terms of these quantified self directions. so that might put some people off of not wanting it but there's going to be a price that's coming with so you should dedicate uh, a, a sizable portion of your agency, of your life plan about, just like today, people, the diet enthusiasts, the fitness enthusiasts, the sleep enthusiasts. Uh, and by the way, all these three things are good if you do things, but they're not going to give you two extra healthy decades. You really need advanced biomedicine for that. And that's what we're talking about. 
Um, I think I I, I I was talking about something else again. <laughs> and that's the, that's the... So what what you were talking about was the fact that many of the films and science fiction present this in a dystopian way. And I think one of your initiatives of is better education, that more people yeah. from all ages of their life will learn. Some of the things we were talking about earlier on, about the hallmarks of aging, they'll learn about it when they're young in a simplified version. But they'll learn about uh, how history, history has shown many examples in which technologies supported by governments have indeed reached through to all areas of society. So tell me about your plans for yeah. education here. Some yeah. of the funds you have set aside in principle will be used to develop new educational courses and to deliver them. So there's the science education that should be part of this big main chunk of money we're talking about, which is a top-down solution. By the way, another program point was to set up a coordinated big um, um, institution for Europe, all European institution for healthy longevity. And by the way, other parties, for in case of the German party, they are talking about the same thing. Um, that is also a top-down way of implementing. But what you mentioned is the third point that I added, uh, the, it's a public education problem about just really, um, you should really be able to tell people, even at the primary school, like I'm doing with my kids, first of all, that, what a compromised state biological aging gives for most of the pe all the people. And uh, they see it, by the way, this is how ageism starts, starts as well, very early on and that old little lady over there uh, can hardly move and it's not giving them a, ba um, a balanced view. But once you tell them and realize them that this process, what we have learned about is so dynamic and you can change it in many ways. And in fact, this is what demographers are seeing. It's called um, shifting mortality scenario. So it's called the malleability of aging in terms of if they see cohorts and how their old age survival goes, they are always, it's like follows a traveling wave. So it's always pushing the limits. By the way, when I was young, all the time, uh, my first understanding was about all the people, that these people are the real pioneers that are operating at the limits. Uh, and these people, we should use their experience and their braveness of really what they are facing. And you want to pull this message about the change so we can counteract these processes now with scientific understanding and technology, if we can um, dedicate enough um, budget and, and uh, enough political leverage, power behind it. So if you go out to primary school, you can, you can simulate aging. You can talk about aging like climate change is now being talked about in all segments of society. And in case of uh, the, the bottom-up processes I'm talking about, uh, I don't have a particular detailed policy proposal how you elicit such a response in all sorts of other people. But individually, I know that um, People are really surprised to learn how much we can do here. And it's just a basic primary educational tool that we need to figure out. You should be very smart about this uh, to get it, it, this done. It seems many people are unaware that some uh, creatures, uh, some species don't age in the same way that we humans age. I mean, we humans age in the sense that the older we get, the more likely we are to die. Our mortality increases on a fairly constant rate from about the 35 years onwards. But there are some fish and there are some birds that, uh, of course, they still die, but they don't die at an increasing rate as they get older. And there is, for example, an albatross that's even got a name called Wisdom that is now, I think, 66 years old, uh, carefully measured. And not only is it 66 years old, but every single year it lays uh, an egg and gives birth to a healthy chick. There is no signs at all that this bird is getting weaker or sicker as it gets older. When I talk to people about this, they're often astonished. They say, why has nobody told us about this? And there are many other examples of regeneration in the nature and uh, many examples of the latest uh, breakthroughs that can extend the healthy lives yeah. of the creatures we spoke about earlier, including mice and uh, flies, uh, worms, yeah. uh, that uh, can be applied in middle age and can increase life not by making them frail, but can extend in almost every aspect. So that's part of the education I feel needs to come. It may be also analogous to education about hygiene. 
So we go back 200 years or so, most people took uh, infectious diseases as a given. There was nothing much you could do about them. They were sort of the way of nature. They were acts of God. And gradually we learned about the importance, not just of washing hands with water, but of uh, what we now call antiseptics. Uh, we learned about viruses. And as a result of this kind of education, many of the diseases which formerly were so widespread, the infectious diseases are a fraction of the, the problems that they used to be. And I think you and I will say it's the same about uh, aging. It's a time to bring it in from the fringe of knowledge and put it in the mainstream of knowledge. And not only will people open their eyes, but many more people will say, you know what, they would like to dedicate their career to this field. So rather than studying one or two other interesting things, which previously they had thought about, they would put more of their effort onto this. So that's what I would see is going to be some of the benefits of this education. Yeah, if you, yeah. And if you look into the model organism, the, the reason, uh, so, we, we have done 30-fold increase in maximum lifespan in the nematode worms. In mice, which is much closer to us, in terms of generally speaking, there's a, some zombie cell treatments have given 30% of uh, average lifespan increase already. So these mice are really living over two years old. So I actually envy them in that respect, in that one respect. So we already solved this. I wish I could be, a, that's a, probably a bad joke. Um, the other reason about why politics should be very important here was the regulation issue, the regulatory issues. So, and we already see signs of this. So this relates to the problem of whether we should consider biological aging a disease. And legally speaking, and if you think in terms of the US and the FDA approval, in terms to be able to develop uh, medicines against particular diseases, you need to have it qualified as a disease. You need to have it qualified as a disease to make the case for big pharma to move in with the money. And uh, the, the status of aging as a biological disease, well, it's not that but it's really, really hard to conceptually discriminate it from all the effects of diseases. So if you just run an argument in your mind, an ad absurdum argument that let's assume that um, nobody dies uh, out of, oh, let's forget this, it's a bit more complicated uh, philosophical argument. But the, the question is here that, um, should we consider aging as a disease? And there's a big legal battle ongoing already in the US where there's many people in the so-called life extensionist movement, the longevity movement are advocating for this being qualified as a disease. So the drug development process should be much faster and no problem. It's a no problem issue. Uh, I agree on that part that if it's a legal case, then we should make that case. Although philosophically speaking, uh, biological aging is such a broad spectra as a disease, so it's not really a disease, it's a life process that we understand that gives rise to much higher morbidity and disease and eventually death. It really goes head in head, but it's not the same conceptually, but this is how politics and regulation works. You need to qualify it and put a label onto it to be able to make pharma and development work. And for this, you need really smart policy. And that's that's coming from the public sphere, that's coming from politics. And I'm not a lawyer, but I understand the philosophical under have problems with it. So political innovation is is ample open space here, and we need to make progress. So, my, yeah, I think I share your view that uh, the regulatory systems are far from ideal for developing some of the <laughs> biomedical innovation. It's not that we should throw all these regulations away. The regulations are well-intentioned, but they are outdated and they're too inflexible. And sometimes they are, the word is captured by the existing industry. The existing industries who have got particular ways of approaching uh, diseases, they make quite a lot of money by selling treatments that people take over a long period of time. And they're doing quite well out of this. I'm not saying they are consciously acting in bad faith here, but the regulatory systems do need to evolve. And it's not going to be an easy problem. You mentioned earlier that there are big problems overall in coordinating large uh, co uh, collaborative projects, but uh, that's not a reason to stop. That's a reason to apply lots of uh, clever, thoughtful, hardworking people from multiple perspectives and come up with better answers. Yeah, so there's the metformin, the big metformin trial, the, um, the TAME trial, that is a big case. So metformin is a diabetes drug just uh, um, that is very, very safe and has been tested in the last three, four decades on 
um, diabetes 2 patients and turns out from observational studies, uh, so not from randomized control trials, that people who are taking these drug, my diabetic, live actually a couple of years longer than non-diabetic people are not taking it. And so that is a reason that many people already in middle age that I know, because sometimes you don't need prescription to get metformin, it's already um, taking, popping this pill in low dose already in like 38 years of age or 45 uh, for the potential life extension, longevity benefits. And there is this TAME trial that's very carefully constructed and it's been in the making for a long, long time because that is the first trial that was approved by the FDA with aging being an indication for all the people that is being given. So we're trying to look into, they are trying to look into the, the biological age markers and how that's gonna change over a course of five years and also mortality. And so that's the US and that's the, where the big things are ongoing. But in terms of the European situation, so in terms of the regulation, the EMA, which is the European Medicine Agency, which by the way, just moved to Amsterdam from London due to the processes that are happening in the UK, big loss to the UK regulation landscape, I can tell you, uh, but big win for Europe. Or for, um, uh, it's not a good phrase, big win for the Netherlands. Um, they're trying to mimic the FDA in many, many ways, but there's another extra added layer of lawyer regulatory complexity in the European medicine market that comes from, it is coming from Europe, where for instance, the German German law had a big effect of the constitutional processes of, of how the legal book of the EU was being made up and how there's regulation. That is a lot of struggle I see and a lot of political innovation and lobbying and push that is being needed to smooth out for a trajectory to to have more healthy decades of life. So right now- That's one of the things you could be working on along with your colleagues in the yes. months and years ahead. Yes. I think um, the, TAME, the TAME trial is interesting uh, because it backs up another thing you were saying earlier. There are interesting regulatory issues which seem to be on the point of being solved. But what's holding it up now is uh, lack of funding. You know, it's going to be quite expensive to hire people to, to, to get so many right. people included in this. And so, that's a clear case when if funding was available, we'd have more confidence if the trial goes ahead that uh, we should be taking this drug more often. And if it is successful, it will raise people's awareness that there can be drugs which don't just uh, deal with one disease, but deal with multiple diseases at the same time. Yeah. Uh, let me tell you about another trend. So by the way, so just to, to demonstrate the process. So I think right now we are at this ah. stage here. And what I want us to improve would be sort of like, so this is normal trajectory of life expectancy. By the way, that stopped in some cases like in the U and the US. And I want to jump, as I said, here, when we are on the trajectory of having like two extra healthy decades of life. And we don't know how far we want to get, what we're going to get so far. But the big problem I see in the party in the UK and in the US, so the expected increase in life expectancy has actually stopped and actually dropped in some cases in the last three or four or five years. And that's quite staggering and quite shocking, not in other countries. And so you can start to figure out what might be the reasons behind it. And compare this to what happened from 2000 to 2015. So the average life expectancy increase worldwide was five years gained, out of which 4.6 years, so the bulk of it, was so-called health span increase. So the these extra gained years mostly are healthy years that you spend. But still what you want is health span extension going very, very close with life expectancy increase. And the, the fact that it has stopped in the UK and actually the bulk of this decline has affected 65 people, 65 years of age or older. Now, this stop or drop is like a couple of months life expectancy you're, you're losing, but you're not gaining. And so we are sort of off the tracks. I feel time is out of joint. Another way of adding this absurdity, another way of saying that me as a scientist and a philosopher and a longevity business person is now trying to take up the political coat or hoodie or suit or whatever comes with this to advocate this cause. Um, 
Well, there's a lot more we could say about the causes of the decline in yeah. uh, life extension and the researchers in America. I think Angus Dayton and his wife done a lot of research into the actual causes in the various uh, groups of people dying more often than used to be the case. And a lot of it's due to uh, being people being depressed and upset and uh, losing their vision in life. And so people are dying because of drug addiction, because of bad uh, food. The people are addicted to the wrong food, addicted to the wrong drugs, and many people are committing suicide at shocking levels. And so it's tied up with the issue of mental health. We could spend a long time talking about that. And I think any politician who wants to talk about extending healthy life has to address the issues as to why people are suffering worse mental health in at least some parts of the world now than before. Yeah. But I'd like to finish the discussion. We don't have that long left. I'd like to feed in a couple more questions yeah, that we'll we've be raised lovely. in the yes. chat. Uh, and by the way, people who are watching, now is the time to uh, add your final questions into the, the text chat. We won't necessarily stop at exactly half past, but uh, we shouldn't continue too long. The question's about uh, sh how important is the protection of patents? For example, do you have views as to whether the longevity industry and the benefits will be served by uh, allowing uh, companies to patent uh, uh, things like uh, genetic expressions. So questions about uh, patent. I don't know whether you've got views on that. And tied in with that is questions about transparency. Should the politicians be forcing the big high-tech companies to be more transparent in terms of their algorithms and processes? Or is it okay for them to continue to keep a lot of secrets in how they operate? So this would be the question of like open science or open access as well, or how to, uh, it's the same, it's it's the two sides of the same coin. Uh, I don't have a very articulate view about patents in general, but I know that if, for instance, you think in terms of digital health, um, what matters here really is the data, not the pat patents that you have. And if you, you, you consider factory and uh, machine learning techniques, um, it, they need to operate on a lots of data that that cannot be patented. So the main vehicle uh, right now, as I see, is data, not as much as, as the IP, which is the traditional big pharma and venture capital model is based on. In terms of these longevity issues, I would more be willing to not care as much about patents as opposed to uh, pushing transparency further, probably. Yeah. And that but, seems to be analogous with the case in the other aspects of high tech, that a uh, that lack of transparency in companies such as Facebook and uh, Google and YouTube is yeah. uh, legitimately a cause of concern. And what politicians can do is to ensure that uh, these uh, big decisions are not taken uh, behind closed doors, but are the subject of democratic decisions. Yeah, uh, and in the EU actually, these are the so-called tech hoax. I think these EU Brussels um, politicians who are giving these big charges for uh, Google, Facebook, uh, really there's a concentrated um, they are under attack in many ways, legally speaking, because this is the big battle of our time in many ways. And this next wave of biomedicine we're talking about is just about to come, and we have uh, the calls to make right now. Um, in case there's no more questions, right, but just if there's any any more, just just disrupt me. Well, I wanted to ask about your links with the Germany. I mean, you you did mention that in local elections there had been 2.5 percent uh, votes in some regions in favour of the party from Felix Wirth. That sounds like a, a good step forwards. Did I, I hear think, that right? Sorry, I think it was I've, um, on the longevitypolitics.global uh, page, which is my campaign website. It's a very um, rudimentary one, but there's a deep interview with Felix uh, when he talks about all this. And they reached 1.5%, I think, in 2016, in the first local elections, more than this famous pirate uh, party that was in Berlin, which I have not heard about. You might have heard about because you're very informed. Um, and um, so Felix is a good case. And that uh, so he was an engineer. Um, uh, uh, computer scientist like uh, and then once he has learned about the sense approach which is 
if you heard this name, Aubrey de Grey, who is the main guru in longevity, whose ideas about the comprehensive list of the processes and what we could do about them uh, on all fields of aging and all domains affecting all of your body, uh, started in the early 2000s in Cambridge, here where I live. Uh, by the way, uh, yeah, when I was a student in Cambridge, the first thing I've done is to went with a pub with Aubrey and sat down and talk about longevity in the course. So when he heard about this, he's a really good case. He just pursued a biochemistry degree first. And then he realized he was doing lab experiment that the progress he can reach is just not fast enough to affect people in a lifetime. And he's just, in young, early, middle age, as I am. And so he dedicated, now his purpose is, is the same thing. If you committed to something like I was very early on, you can, it's such a big problem, you can look at it from many points of view. So I've done science, Felix done um, philosophy, I've done journalism, science journalism, bioinformatics, and now politics, because that seems to be the, um, the weakest link right now to, to make progress to to have this cause and the mission heard um and actually we're looking into climate change a lot in terms of um drawing uh, comparisons between these two things and here um so uh, um i have a, a philosophy book draft a blog as well so in the last year when i when I, as a longevity startup funder i started to face these ethical problems that are coming up related to the technology we're using related to the prospect we are working on um, I really went back to philosophy to continue my philosophy thesis that I'd done 15 years ago, which was about the moral political consequences of regenerative medicine and longevity biomedicine. Uh, it's about questions about what matters for us as moral persons uh, and how really a life would look like. And just to go back to the ecological awareness, which is now full blown, if you think about Extinction Rebellion, it's really on the agenda. The kids are going to the streets. It's actually, I've never seen this before. Uh, it's, it's a quite nerdy cause because there's a lot of science behind it. So climate, how do you know what happens on the Arctic, on the ice cap, uh, fossil fuels? There's lots of science there. Nobody really knows what is the central source of all this. But the same science is not there for aging. And if you think about... Uh, how can we expect the problem? How can we expect to maintain a healthy ecosystem of the planet if we cannot even maintain healthily our bodies that are much smaller, but almost as complex ecosystem by themselves? Those 40 trillions of human cells, almost as many bacterial cells. This should be, I see a lot of um, parallel uh, things. I, I adopt this term eco longevity. So just if you look into the problem, so these are ecosystem thinking. Uh, if you think about my body or think about the planet, and by the way, health is used, like thinking about the health of the financial sector, thinking of, this is what banks, advertisers are telling you. We're thinking every day about the health of our planet. And we're thinking less about the health of our bodies and what we could do with science and technology to, to make it more robust uh, against biological aging not to enhance all around. I'm not talking about that. And I see a lot of parallels between um, the ecological thinking and longevitarian thinking. Longevitarian is another term I'm using, not as frequently. And just one idea about living longer, you get to see the effects of your actions in life more. You're gonna be way more responsible if you're living a longer life. You're gonna be really on the way to become the guardians of the galaxy if you're living much, much longer. If you just do this hardcore thought experiment to your mind, just, just, just for a sec, let's assume we have a technology that can give you 150 years, 200. Just, just think yourself, if you are 20 years old, just add one more zero, you are 200 years old, you have the same biological setup sort of, you are normal species functioning, you are doing it, you're not compromised but how responsibly would be behaving in this planet. And I, I see the positive connections here, which nobody really highlighted so far. Attila, I've got one final question for you. Yeah. I know you're hoping to get 100,000 odd votes to take you over the threshold. What's your plan in the 
scenario in which you don't quite get elected this time round? What yeah. are you going to be targeting? Are you going to be creating a, not extinction rebellion, but a healthy longevity rebellion, for example? Or I mean, no. do you have plans in mind for what to do next, or are you not going to think about that until the election's no. over? Yeah. So this is a very radical idea. If you put into the center of your thinking, that's what I've done, and this is what I, other people should do. I think, and this is what I'm trying to advocate for. Uh, but it's not a, uh, it's a radical idea, but it's a radical idea. It's, uh, it's life conservatism at its most revolutionary. So there's lots of ways of we are wanting to be conserving on our own body. So I'm definitely not the type who's going to be going to the White House, uh, White House or, or Westminster and chain myself there if we are not getting any extra healthy decades of our life because it doesn't work. Alarmism works in your individual life when your family is in danger, when you see your older ones going and you're trying to save their life, like I tried to do it for my father, and this, anybody has stories like this, then you can be alarmist and you must be, but not about a cause like this. And you don't want to um, but what I would do if I wouldn't get elected, that's, that's easy. So I have my longevity startup I'm doing. I have a philosophy book uh, that I'm working on. It's called Open Lifespan, which I'm trying to publish, that I worked out this political philosophy, and I'm actually trying to apply it in practice right now. It's, it's a very interesting philosophical experiment for me to come up with arguments that you made up in a theoretical academic thing why if we would live longer would be living in a more democratic situation where we would have more space for consensual democracy why would it be more liberal more individual freedoms to start with why would we be able to flourish more why would it be a less ageist society why would it be more diverse more peaceful and more egalitarian in a way of more equality of opportunity would be ensured if you get to live more life, you can always restart. You can rectify your position about your life plan. There's just this basic philosophical principle that backs all of this is that it's just simply much better to be alive than to be dead because you have your agency. So maybe we should bring you to a London Futurist event in London sometime to talk about open lifespan. So what you have said, if I play back your answer to you, is that you think this philosophy needs to be more widely understood and it will help to change people's minds. People are struggling to find a philosophy to make sense of things currently. Many of the old uh, ways of thinking seem less adequate today because so many of the environmental uh, context has changed there's so much more diversity than before and so a new philosophy is needed an open lifespan could be a core part of that uh, i hope so it's it's um it's quite radical in a way of focusing on this one thing but using my philosophical background i'm really going and asking contemporary philosophers professors uh mainly living ones because of trying to engage conversation with them and trying to test this idea of us living longer. What is the philosophical problem there? And I need to tell you that it's not immortality because nobody really thinks about becoming def death defying person. We're just gonna be going into an uncertain trajectory, which you can describe as indefinite lifespan because we really don't know how far we're going to get. And this is a radical idea because it's, it's not a mortal, immortal binary thing. It's we have this close lifespan and we have this subspecia eternitatis point of view that we're taking in philosophy from our God's point of view, which I, I cannot think of at all. And there's something in between that nobody really thought of, which is a very uncertain situation, but it's way more enriching our current existence. And I'm trying to figure out this. So to get the thought experiment done right and trying to criticize based on that our current way of thinking our correct main that is suited either for close lifespan this thing that we are experiencing now this scarcity situation or immortality which i don't have much to say about <laughs>